Okay, well, we're ready to start. I'd like to thank, thank you all for tuning in and welcome to our third webinar from sponsored by the Lutchens Trust America and the Lutchens Trust in the UK. It's a, it's a joint venture between the two organizations. Well, today, um, we're having a speaker, uh, a panel with Dr. Nick Webb and Jeff Speakman. Uh, I'd like to introduce them briefly. I'm standing in just momentarily for Martin Lutchens as your host. So Nick Webb, Dr. Nick Webb is a qualified architect and a lecturer at the Liverpool School of Architecture. As a researcher, he's interested in digital tools and techniques and that can be used as methods to extend our knowledge and critique our understanding of historic works of architecture, whether they are built works or whether they're works that have maybe been damaged and destroyed or perhaps not even built at all. And that's, that's the case today. Uh, his research is, uh, focuses on methods that enable new, new information to be provided that would not have been impossible possible in the pre-digital context. So it's very important research. Um, he's currently principal investigator, investigator on the AHRC funded Facing the Past, utilizing the design and construction of Ingle vaults using digital techniques and he's working on it with a team of researchers at Liverpool. Our other panelist is Jeff Speakman. He's assistant curator of, Ar in the, of the Archaeology Museum of Liverpool. This is one of eight museums and art galleries around Merseyside that form the National Museums Liverpool, which Jeff has worked with. Uh, I know Martin was going to welcome you all. Um, he was going to tell a very wonderful story about how uh, Edwin Lutchens first met and got involved, uh, the bishop, and got involved in the project for Liverpool. Uh, he was expecting the um, Richard Downey had just been appointed Roman Catholic Archbishop of Liverpool and asked for a meeting with Lutchens, which he was very excited about. And I don't know what he expected, but they met at the Garrett Club. And the first thing the bishop said as he came toward him was, will you have a cocktail? So that, I think that from then on, they got along famously. So at this point, I'll turn it over to our, our panelists and looking forward to what you have to say. So hopefully now you should be able to see our screen. Yeah. And uh, thanks again for inviting both Jeff and I to talk to you all today. We thought that a good place to start would be Karl Laubin's uh, wonderful painting that he did. And we can think about Lutchen's projects as a family of designs. So if we begin here, we can see at the bottom right with the Surrey vernacular style architecture. We could almost think about this as being maybe a cousin to the later housing, which is in the Queen Anne style or, or Neo-Georgian style architecture. And then his work evolves into the more elemental forms that we see, and the arrow you can see here is pointing at the Tifal Memorial of the Missing of the Somme. So, as I said, we see this more elemental work as well as that of the Commonwealth War Graves Commission generally. And the big one in the middle that you can't really miss is just design for Liverpool Cathedral. So, thinking about relationships, family relationships, you could almost compare Tifal, which is down here again with Liverpool up here as being either siblings or even twins. And I think Jeff's going to say a little bit more now about the scale of the two. I came to the uh, project quite late um, when the um, working on, on the exhibition at the Museum of Liverpool. And um, one of the things that struck me was the comparison between these two buildings, Tietwell and the cathedral. Um, and I always sort of viewed Tikval in the French countryside uh, overlooking the Somme, the Battle of the Somme, as being probably about the same size as the actual cathedral. But this, this painting, this wonderful painting, actually gives you to scale the two buildings. And you can see that uh, Tikval doesn't come anywhere near the comparison of the scale and uh, immensity of the cathedral. And I, I just wanted to show that sort of archaeological uh, viewpoint non-architectural view of the uh, the painting. Back to you, Nick. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll let you carry on, Jeff, on, on Liverpool. 
This is an image uh, painted by Ben Johnson uh, for the Museum of Liverpool um, and it was actually painted before many of these buildings were actually uh, completed so it, it, it was more of a conceptual uh, image of, of the city of Liverpool or the city centre. Uh, the building marked with the yellow arrow is the, the new Museum of Liverpool which opened in 2011 and now houses, houses the, uh, the model of the uh, Catholic Cathedral, Blutchings Cathedral. Um, I wanted to show or point out the building in more in the middle of the screen with the red arrow. This is the Hilton Hotel, it only opened in 2012, but it's actually built within the boundaries of um, the first dock in Liverpool, now known as the Old Dock. Uh, and during the uh, development of that building, they actually revealed the brick lines of the, the dock itself, which uh, still exists underground. Uh, but that was the first dock opened in 1715. And in the uh, period from 1715 to 1930, uh, extra docks were built. They're all into reclaimed land. So all the docks you see on this image are actually reclaimed lands into the river. Uh, and there's now seven miles of docks. And it was only, only because the docks were built uh, that uh, Liverpool became a port. The actual tidal range uh, is, is amazing. It's, uh, it's up to 10 metres different. Um, and so without the docks, the, um, the ships would just sink to the bottom and turn over. Um, this image shows you, uh, unfortunately, Liverpool is hidden behind my face. Um, but shows you the lines of trade that developed from Liverpool to the rest of the world. Uh, and just next to me, you'll see the uh, position of Cove or Cork, uh, which is quite important to the story as we develop. If you go to the next slide. Um, so uh, again, behind <laughs> Edwin Lutchins is the uh, Albert Dock in Liverpool. This was opened in 1845. 46 uh, and it's coming up to its new birthday. It's one of the largest collections of um, listed buildings in the country. Next slide. And uh, the three buildings in the center of the screen are known as the three graces. Uh, you have the Liver building on the left, the Port of Liverpool on the right with the dome and then in the center marked with the arrow is the uh, Cunard building. And this represents one of the sort of more famous things that's come out of Liverpool. The Cunard line was born and uh, ran from Liverpool for many years before it moved to, um, to Southampton. And behind the Port of Liverpool building, slightly hidden, is the building that was the headquarters of the um, White Star Line, which is the home to the Titanic. The next slide. Uh, uh, there is another arrow behind my head, which points out where the mm. Anglican, mm. <laughs> yes, which points to the Anglican Cathedral. Uh, in the end, the two cathedrals were built on either end of a uh, sandstone uh, bluff overlooking the city, um, linked by Hope Street, which is always seen as quite a, a, a good thing today. But at the time that the two cathedrals were originally being built, um, there was a lot of sectarian division between the two uh, religions in the city. Next slide. Okay, so if, if I just take over for a second, just to give a bit of background about how Liverpool came to a Catholic cathedral. So the idea was first raised in the middle of the 19th century through a design by Edwin Welby Pugin. Uh, and this was not on the site that the Catholic cathedral now sits on. This was out of the city uh, in the suburbs of Everton. Uh, it's interesting, it's different to the Lutchen scheme. It's very much a Gothic design. However, there are parallels between the two. The main one being, you can see in the image on the bottom right of the main image uh, that there's a lady chapel. And to the right of that, we have an image of it. This was the only part that was completed. So there's the parallel between the Pugin scheme and Lutchen's. They both had a portion of them built and then they were stopped for various reasons. Unfortunately though the Lady Chapel here uh, was demolished in the early 1990s. Moving forwards, uh, the reason why they decided not to complete this uh, version of the cathedral was so that they could spend money instead on 
uh, other institutions like schools and orphanages. So it wasn't seen as appropriate to be building a Catholic cathedral at this time. Moving forwards though, in 1911, Liverpool becomes an archdiocese. Uh, so Bishop Whiteside becomes archbishop. Uh, he, he dies uh, in 1921 and is succeeded by Archbishop, archbishop Keating. Keating suggests a fitting memorial to Whiteside would be to again consider building a Catholic cathedral in the city. So he begins to raise funds and forms a cathedral committee for this. However, Keating dies in 1928. At this point, the gentleman you can see, the larger image in the, uh, at the bottom of the screen, uh, Dr. Richard Downey, he takes over as Archbishop. And uh, I believe that uh, Jeff will give you a little bit more information on that. Uh, on the, the last screen, there, there, was a, a, there was a little map behind my head. Um, one of the things that D Downey, or, or was different about Downey, was that um, from 1911, the, the Bishop of Liverpool became archbishops, and they, they governed the whole of the northern province of, of England, which includes the whole of Lancashire, uh, Hexham and Newcastle, uh, Salford, um, Newcastle, Leeds, Middlesbrough, um, and it basically uh, when it came to actually start raising funds for the uh, new cathedral, he, Downey didn't see it as something that was uh, uh, just a Liverpool project, it was a project of the North. Unfortunately, uh, many of the other bishops disagreed with him and he didn't necessarily get the support that he hoped for uh, to raise the funds to build the cathedral in the end. He, he was very much um, a prince bishop. He was probably the last of those uh, princely bishops who, who decided we will do this. Uh, previously Keating had said we're not going to build until we have the money but Downey said God will provide and uh, set forward on the project. Over to you Nick. Well in fact it's probably me again. Um, the site that Keating had discovered was actually the site of the Liverpool Workhouse. It was originally built in 1771 to house the uh, poor and unemployed of Liverpool and the surrounding districts. Uh, and it was at the highest point of uh, above Liverpool. Um, Lutchins famously quoted the, the fact that the site is 21 feet higher than um, the Ca Anglican Cathedral at the other end of Hope Street. Um, and although L uh, Lutchins was a Protestant and uh, the architect of the Anglican Cathedral was a Catholic, the, the actual sectarianism at the time was still quite strong. Uh, and uh, there was a, a, quite a battle to control this or to get control of the site. Uh, the Paula Union who ran the workhouse refused to sell it to the Catholics and it was only after it became land uh, belonging to the uh, council in Liverpool that they eventually sold it to Downey, who completed the deal by 1930. Um, he wrote this wonderful quote about uh, seeing a wonderful, powerful building situated on the highest points of the great city, dominating the, the city and the river and commerce. Um, so he, he was very much uh, uh, about Catholicism being the top dog and the, um, the, the primary uh, religion in, in Liverpool. Of two. Okay, so just picking up on Robin's comment from earlier about cocktails, uh, we should probably speak a little bit more about the first meeting of uh, Downey and uh, Lutyens. So as we know, they met in the Garrick Club. It's one of those classic architectural tales that we seem to hear about all the time, particularly in architectural education. The two meet, a sketch is drawn, and voila, we have a cathedral. Uh, we don't know if the image on the top right is the exact one, most likely not, but it's, it's likely that it would, it would have been something similar to this that Lutyens would have drawn on the napkin uh, and that would have convinced Downey uh, over a cocktail to design the cathedral. I think it's fair to say that the, uh, the pair had quite a close relationship. Uh, one of my favourite things that I've read about it was that Lutyens told Dr Downey, uh, the Archbishop, he told him a joke and he said, what fun do monks have? The answer was none, i.e. N-U-N. So it's the strength of this relationship, as I've, I've 
So I think it carries the whole project through. Uh, and later on, when the scheme's abandoned, I think it's, it's largely to do with the fact that both of these guys have sadly passed away. And we'll come back to that maybe later on. OK, so on to some of the drawings now. The, the image that you see, the larger one on the left, this is uh, from 1929. This is an elevation. And Lutyens brought these drawings up to Liverpool to show the cathedral authorities what he was working on. Then uh, on the right hand side, we can see a sketch. Uh, this is by Lutyens and below it, it's one of the famous perspectives by Cecil Fari. The two images are actually uh, from different time periods. The top one's 1929, the one below is 1930. These two images were used in the press in the middle of 1930 when the, the site at the top of Brownlow Hill that Jeff mentioned, when that was confirmed that they could purchase it, that's when it went live to the press and these were two of the images featured. Moving on from that, uh, the drawings were exhibited at the Royal Academy in 1932. Uh, Lutyens continues to work on them and then again we see this model here uh, which is exhibited in 1934. But I'll pause for a second to let Jeff fill in some more information about the model. Lutyens decided that uh one of the ways to uh, sell the, the, the or to raise funds for the cathedral was to produce the model to, to actually uh, show in 3D um, what the, the cathedral would look like. Um, they didn't have the sort of skills that Nick has got to yeah. produce all these wonderful drawings that um, he will be showing you later. Uh, but the model was built, constructed between 1932 and 1934 by J.P. Thorpe and Company in London. Uh, Twelve craftsmen were employed uh, for the two years at a cost of £5,000. But one of the important things to point out was that even then they couldn't afford to complete the model. And the uh, cathedral authorities um, told them to stop in this current situation. Uh, this is, uh, the model is shown here on display into the Walker Art Gallery in 2007, just after the uh, conservation work, the 13 years of conservation work have been completed. Uh, and luckily in the Walker, they were able to show the, the model open. Uh, the model is actually made up of several different sections and you'll see at the front there, the, the actual front entrance pulled away from the interior. Um, and it, this exhibition was uh, uh, enabled people to actually view inside the, the cathedral, inside the model, uh, to see the image that um, nobody had seen before 2007. Uh, on its current display in the Museum of Liverpool, we didn't have the space and it's actually enclosed and the uh, interior is uh, revealed by a, a video that was taken, which I think Nick is going to mention further about um, shortly. Uh, the, the model shows the latest versions with the four heavy buttresses. Um, as I say, there was 13 years of conservation. The conservation actually cost £750,000, which is over US dollars uh, and came with the help of a, a, a Heritage Lottery Fund grant of £263,000. This is just for the model. Can you imagine how much the actual cathedral was going to cost? Back to you, Nick. Okay, so one of the things that I was interested in using the digital model models for was to try and show that there are these various different versions of the project. And because we don't have the definitive artifact, which would have been the built cathedral itself, we're always looking at these different sources. So we're always looking back at, for example, Cecil Fari's perspective or the Big Thought model. So what I was trying to do was replicate Cecil Fari's perspective, and you can see an image of that here, and show the three key exterior design changes uh, using that. So here we see the 1929 design, and if we look at the dome itself, it has a smaller stainless steel dome. And we can also see the bell towers, which are situated over the, the transept doors. If we go forward to the 1930 scheme, though, we see that the bell tower has shifted along the transept and the dome itself gets a bit larger. So if we just go between the two there, hopefully there's not too much of a lag for you and you can see that. And likewise, then moving forwards to 1933, 
we get the largest change of all. And Lutyens had already stated when they revealed the model that uh, everything above the main roof level was provisional. So here we have these four great buttresses that replace eight smaller ones, as Jeff mentioned. Uh, and we can see that the stainless steel dome has been replaced by a stone dome. Also notice that the bell towers themselves get quite a bit more elaborate than their previous version. Moving forwards from that, I was always intrigued in my research in, in some of the comments that people were making like Butler and Summerson, and they, they explain that it's very difficult to try and understand how the various components of the cathedral, cathedral come together. Uh, they say it's difficult to do this in words, and you really need a model to do it. So in my opinion, it's best to think about the cathedral as a solid lump of earth, and you have to carve pieces out of it in order to form the interior. So I'm going to try and work backwards for this. I'm going to build up the interior pieces and then we can take them all away. So to show you how those interior pieces are built up, I've paired them up with a, a diagram uh, with uh, some text that Lutyens used in his address to Liverpool City Council when he was trying to get the scheme built. So here we can see in the image uh, the smallest arches, which are 15 feet wide by 45 feet high. These intersect with the next set, and then again, uh, another set. And that's followed by the largest of the archways, which, uh, which carry the narthex, the transepts, and the nave. And finally, then we add the dome. And then if we take all of this volume away, we're left with a very basic model of what the cathedral may have been like. OK, so just um, stopping off on these uh, quite well-known drawings uh, from the Lutyens Memorial that show a comparative between St. Peter's, St. Paul's and Liverpool. Unfortunately, I think uh, Liverpool is obscured in plan. Uh, I can tell you that it's exactly the same size or thereabouts as St. Peter's in plan. And St. Peter's and Liverpool together tend to make St. Paul's look a little bit like a parish church. If we look at the sections on the left, we have St. Peter's, St. Paul's and Liverpool again. What's clear is that Liverpool is dwarfing St. Peter's as well as St. Paul's. There was a delegation that went out to Rome uh, to seek permission to build the cathedral at Liverpool, and they, they were able to say that the dome at Liverpool is smaller than that at St. Peter's. But they get away with it, basically, on the technicality. It's, I can't remember which one it is. It's either the inner or the outer dome is slightly smaller than that of St. Peter's. However, I think if you look at these sections on the left, it's very clear that the mass of Liverpool is, is much bigger than that of St. Peter's. And I'll hand back to Jeff now to talk a bit more about the local context. When we were um, discussing the exhibition of the model in the, in the new museum, um, I was trying to um, give an impression of the scale of the model, of, of the, the actual building. Um, so every time I went out into a walk, I was taking photos of different views of, of Liverpool. And you can see from these four different views how the, the, the two buildings, the Anglican and uh, uh, Catholic cathedrals, all position themselves differently on the skyline. Um, I actually ended up with a, a, a image that we superimposed the uh, Lutyens Cathedral on top of, which uh, we're going to see something similar to that later on. Um, but you can see that both buildings, even now, even though the, the development of new skyscrapers in Liverpool is, is happening, uh, the two cathedrals still dominate the skyline uh, to this day. Uh, next slide. Um, and this is an image Nick has put together kindly uh, to show the, the, the three buildings, the Anglican Cathedral, the Metropolitan Cathedral as it was built, the Catholic Cathedral on the right, known as Paddy's Wigwam, uh, because of the Irish Catholics that came into Liverpool in the 1840s and 50s. And then behind it is Lutyens' design. So again, you can see that the top of the dome over, overarches everything that would have been in Liverpool at the time. Next slide. And this is uh, one that was taken from a, a video that was put together by River Media, a company in Liverpool. I think it was done for the Walker Art Gallery exhibition. 
but it shows uh, the two cathedrals linked by Hope Street. But again, uh, it shows the Lutchins Cathedral on a much higher level over dominating the university and the buildings where Nick actually works and, uh, and obviously dominating the Anglican Cathedral. It was, all, it was all about power. We are the better religion. Next slide. These were postcards that were actually produced and sold as part of the uh, campaign to raise funds for the, uh, the cathedral. These are two buildings in Liverpool. The one on the left is the Victoria Tower uh, as part of the University of Liverpool. And the one on the right, uh, many people may recognize as the Liver Building in, uh, in Liverpool. Uh, if you show the next slide, you'll see what magical tricks um, they did in the 1930s to try and show the scale of the Lutchins Cathedral. And these are whole to light postcards. So without a light behind them, you see the original black and white image. Um, and as soon as the light is displayed behind them, the, you get the scale of the uh, cathedral that would have been built. They produced a, a series of them, if you show the next slide. Uh, and this is one um, showing Nelson's column in, in, in London. I think these more uh, symbols were more internationally recognisable um, outside of Liverpool. And again, you can see that Nelson's column, which uh, dominates uh, Trafalgar Square, uh, would, have, would have been tiny in comparison to the cathedral. Next slide. Well, the... Uh, uh, model was on display in 2007 uh, and as we were planning the exhibition in the Museum of Liverpool we asked people to uh, write down their thoughts and memories about the uh, the, the 1930s and, and, and the period when the collecting was happening and we got these re different responses some were very um, positive and were, were sort of uh, memorable in, in that the people remembered putting pennies in um, a penny, uh, pet, penny jars um, where they could uh, sort of donate to them and that it was a, it's an, a, a weekly uh, project that, where they would actually save money towards the uh, cathedral but others were more negative one lady uh, told us about how her uh, mother had been forcibly um, or forced to, to make a donation towards the cathedral uh, funds uh, by being literally outed in the parish church for not having paid anything into the fund for that week. And she moans that this was her, uh, her mother's uh, food money for the, for the family for the week. Um, so the actual Catholic priest was forcing money out of them to build the cathedral. One thing you have to remember at this time is that the Catholics were generally a, a poorer uh, group of people. The Anglican Cathedral was largely uh, built by money from large donors uh, and, and millionaires, whereas the Catholic Cathedral was going to be built literally from the pennies of the, uh, the poor Irish, largely, who lived in the, uh, the packed streets next to the docks in Liverpool. Next slide. Uh, and so we've put in here a few images of the, the model. Um, uh, there's a slide coming up discussing the, the central altar shortly, but um, they give an impression of the size of the building from the interior. You note the, the different coloured woods that appear in the model. Um, the model was badly damaged when it was in the crypt and large pieces went missing. Uh, so the dark wooden uh, schemes are, are the original pieces and the lighter wooden pieces are, are the ones that were replaced. Next slide. Um, Unfortunately, I have to send Chris Mosley his apologies. He was the lead curator on the project and spent 13 years actually um, uh, conserving the, uh, the model. Um, unfortunately, we've lost some of his quotes here, but uh, he, he, he sent me a, a, an email just sort of expressing the thanks to the various uh, curators at the time who enabled us to raise the £750,000. Um, but one of the things that... Uh, Chris mentioned was that when they completed the model, 
uh, all the, it, it, the model is so big that they couldn't actually put it together at any point during those 13 years. So it was only when it actually went on display that he saw it complete for the first time. And he looked down into the nave and towards the altar uh, and suddenly realized that Edwin Lutyens would never have seen this, that, that view, the complete view in, inside the building. And um, he, as, as the final line there, it says, I wonder what the great man would have thought. Um, so yes, for, for Chris, this was a sort of project of his lifetime and uh, he'd done such an amazing job to actually put it back together. Next slide. As you can see, it comes in, diff comes in different sections and uh, has to be fitted together whenever it's moved. Uh, one thing I forgot to say uh, earlier was that the model was designed so that you could actually crawl underneath and actually stand up under the dome uh, as part of the experience of um, seeing what it would have been like inside. Um, so that they, they did think of more simpler ways than Nick is producing now uh, to, to allow people to experience what the, the actual cathedral would look like. Next slide. Over to you, Nick. So, so thanks, Jeff. Um, so this is a still from one of the films that was made inside of the model uh, by Meso Films. It's, it's an endoscopic film. And uh, there's a link at the bottom, and hopefully Marcus will be able to drop in for you in the chat window, uh, the link for this. So in your own time, you can go and have a look at that. But what struck me was the fact that they're trying to recreate what the lighting of the interior might have been like. And this was something that I wanted to do using the digital models that I created. So Summerson states that the interior of the scheme would essentially be very dark. Uh, there wouldn't be much illumination. St. Paul's, in contrast, would be radiant. So you can see here, this is a render. This is a a realistic render is it's choosing a, a cloudy day in Liverpool to show without any additional lighting what it might have been like within that space. So apologies if it does seem a little dark on, on your screen, but unfortunately that's the whole point. I was also interested in how additional lighting might affect this space. So if I go to the next one, uh, Lutyens was very concerned about how it should be lit. And he had arguments back and forth with the cathedral authorities. He stated that he wanted the entire cathedral, bearing in mind this is one of the largest interior spaces in the world, the entire space to be lit by candlelight. He said, you need wondrous view, isn't it glorious and mysterious? So we get a sense here in this image of what that might have been like if at ground level, we're lighting the entire space by candlelight. And I think it does support what he says in that it creates quite an evocative and mysterious space. Compare that to what the cathedral wanted though, they were after electric light and could it get any worse? Flood lighting at that is what they request. And here we can see what that may have looked like. Uh, so the difference is, is very noticeable. The architecture is revealed a lot more. Uh, but you could argue that it's not as mysterious and dark, obviously, as the previous version with candles or even without candles. And just as a side note to that as well, looking through some of the, the source material, uh, this is uh, the view in the Crypt Hall, so uh, one of the only built parts of the cathedral. Uh, and Lutyens was asking that it be finished by plaster. So we can see here these beautiful brick vaults which to me, I think they're, they're a, re you know, a real feat of engineering. But Lutyens wanted them to be covered up uh, so that we don't see the brickwork. So he wanted to, to show them with plaster. And again, I could quickly show as two different renders what they would have looked like had they been plastered and how that creates a much lighter space in contrast, interestingly, to what would have been above in the cathedral. And just looking now at the final kind of set piece that I wanted to talk through with the digital model, and that's looking at Teatval, which uh, we used to introduce in, in the first slide. So Teatval and Liverpool have often been compared. That's, that's for a few reasons. The first one is the time. So this was designed, Teatval, between 1927 and it was completed in 1932. 
whereas Liverpool, as we know, starts in 1929 and construction begins in 1933. So there's a direct overlap, that's the first thing. So perhaps Lutyens was considering Tietbal in his mind when he started to think about the cathedral. Likewise, they feature a series of interlocking arches. That's very striking in terms of the similarities. And finally, it's the use of materials. So we have the use of a pinky red Roman brick, and that's banded against stonework. So there, there's the three kind of key things that pull the schemes together. So I was interested again in one of John Summerson's essays where he discusses the fact that the geometry is pretty much identical between the archways of the two schemes. So I was able to produce a digital model of Teakval, and obviously I've already got one of Liverpool. Uh, by the way, you can access these uh, digital models online, so you can scroll in, you can zoom around them, whatever you like, explore them in your own time, and hopefully Marcus will, will drop those into the chat window. So as I said, I was able to show Teakval, and this is a section of the nave and the nave aisle at the same scale at Liverpool. And then we can overlay the two, so using Liverpool as a ghost image here. And we can be begin to start to see how much that geometry in particular aligns with, uh, with each of the projects. So I'll talk you through that. Here's, here's the largest arch going back into the nave aisle at Liverpool, which is 32 feet wide by 96 feet high with a ratio of one to three. We compare its comparative at Teepval. It has exactly the same width, so 32 feet, this time 80 feet high. So it's, it's not got the same lofty feel as the cathedral would have had. If we look in the other direction, we have the, the second smallest arch, which is 22 feet wide by 66 feet high. And again, a teat valve 22 feet wide. What's really interesting here though, is that that means that the two archways cross in exactly the same space. So they're identical in terms of the air that they fill, apart from the height, obviously. And then the third set, uh, the smallest one still, again, they, may say, they maintain the same width. Uh, it's just the height again that changes and they, they skew to one side ever so slightly. But again, very similar. So the way I was thinking about this was Teakval is almost being used like a design component. It's like a stamp that you place within the cathedral a total of 10 times. So I think the relationship between the two, um, we, we can't really deny that it's, that it's occurred. Just as a final piece on Teakval and Liverpool, uh, this is a line drawing I quickly produced from the same perspective of the two. And we can see here inside the cathedral, how much detail there is. It's a lot more ornate. Uh, if we scroll to the next one, which is Teakval here, we can see it's a lot more stripped back. And that's because Teakval was designed for people of all faiths and none. So it's very much in terms of the design proposal that this happened, whereas Liverpool is a lot more ornate, obviously, because it's a, a Catholic cathedral. Okay, so coming to the end now. So. What happens? So we're in 1933. We've, we've spoken through the design with you. 1933, we have the foundation stone uh, being laid as a ceremony, and we have the canopy here that we can see, also designed by Lutyens. Then, flash forward a, a few years, 1941, work ceases due to wartime restrictions. And then, as we know, Luchin sadly dies in 1944 on New Year's Day, surrounded by drawings of the cathedral. At this point, Adrian Gilbert Scott is made continuator. After the war, restrictions or further restrictions prevent building work from continuing. And in 1953, Dr. Richard Downey dies, the Archbishop. So, as I said at the beginning, it's this point now where we've got the death of both Lutyens and Archbishop Downey, which in my opinion ultimately means that uh, progress on the cathedral uh, or, or the will for it kind of goes. And then over the next few years the crypt itself is capped, so they decide to finish that part off. And in 1959 Archbishop Heenan comes in and he proposes a new competition 
uh, for a, a brand new cathedral, which has to sit on top of and alongside uh, the existing Lutyens crypt. And here we can see the result of that. This is uh, the cathedral that was completed by Sir Frederick Gibbard. And in the foreground, we can see uh, the, the built part of the Lutyens crypt. And there's an arrow pointing at one of the crypt windows that Jeff's just going to pick up on, I think. Yes, the, the, this view is, uh, is, is a perfect example of uh, what we're going to look at in, in the final uh, images of the model itself. Um, and I think when you represent the crypt um, of the cathedral uh, and see how tiny it is in, in, on the model, you realise how big that building was going to be. So if you can show the last slide. Martin visited us a few weeks ago, uh, just before lockdown. Uh, and I managed to take this sneaky photo of him standing next to the uh, the model itself. But you can see down the bottom with the arrow pointing at it, the same window that appeared on, on the previous shot. And the white section on the model uh, immediately above the arrow is, is the crypt. Um, so you can see how, how small uh, a part of the building that was actually um, completed um, sadly, um, as things move forward, um, and I think that's getting close to the end. Yeah, I'll, um, I'll just uh, I'll finish with with two two quotes. The first one from another relative of Lutyens, uh, this time his son, uh, and it alludes to the subtitle of of our talk. Uh, Robert Lutyens states that the cathedral should have been built uh, once and forever, and the very greatest building was never built. And uh, finally, this is a quote by Rob Wilson in his book, Fantasy Architecture. He states that the built environment we inhabit is just the residue of a much greater imaginative world that never saw the light of day, evoking what might have been or still could be the unbuilt, the lost. Okay, thanks everyone. Thank you.